<laughs> okay, thank you. Well, good morning to all of you. Let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to be with us today. Father, we thank you for your many blessings today. We thank you for your protection, for your strength. We praise you, Lord, that you are the mighty King of kings and Lord of lords today. You are over all, seeing all. You are ruling over all. And we give you praise, Lord, for your sovereignty. Father, I lift up those, O oh God, among our congregation who are struggling with physical issues today. Just bring healing. Father, just speak healing over their bodies today, Father. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Ukraine today. Encourage their hearts, Lord. Protect them. And, Lord, we pray for an end to this violence in Jesus' name. Lord, we need you. The church needs you. And we call upon you today. In the day of trouble, we call upon you asking for your help. Lord, be with us today. Let our hearts be open to receive what you are saying, what you're speaking to us. I pray for your anointing that my words would be clear. And God, where I don't get it quite right, that you would take it and make it right, Father, where your truth is proclaimed. We give you glory and honor today. Yes. Amen. 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 Well, I just want to say a thank you to all of those who cooked and baked and bought for the bake sale this weekend. Thank you, Liz, for coordinating that, organizing that. I'm sure some of you are still enjoying those goodies. Um, I'm taking little bites every day, so I'm making them last. I had a little bit this morning for breakfast. It was really good. So thank you for all of those who supported this fundraiser for our Impact Girls Ministry. Well, the time has come. It is almost summer. I know, we just got into spring. But anyway, summer's coming. And as we've done for several years now, we have had a summer read. We have had a book to read. Since we don't meet on a regular basis during the summer, we can't have you getting bored, so we want to give you something to do, and that is to read a good book. And this year, the book is Hope Heals by Catherine and Jay Wolf. Now, some of you may be acquainted with their story. If you haven't heard of them, Catherine was a young wife and mother. Her baby was six months old, and she suffered a stroke from a congenital abnormality, and she survived the stroke. She survived the extensive surgery, but she was left with numerous physical handicaps. And so this story uh, tells their story of the Lord's healing, his strength, and how each day they're still blessed with hope, hope heals. So interesting part of this, if this book, she writes a little bit and then her husband writes a little bit. So you get to see it from his perspective because much of the time that some of this is happening, she was uh, unconscious. So you'll see from her perspective as well as from his. Now I'm going to warn you, this book, it's powerful and it's filled with a lot of raw emotions and a lot of raw pain, but there is always a sweetness, not bitter, maybe frustrated, but not angry, and there's always a sense of giving God the glory. And, you know, even though we may not experience the physical challenges that they have, there is something for us to receive, because as they write this, they're connecting with, I think, something that's universal to all of us, and that is pain that is loss, that's unwanted changes in our lives. We all go through that. And so they do a great job in sharing that. So it's Hope Heals by Catherine and Jay Wolf. I will have copies of the book, hopefully by next week. The suggested donation is $16. You can also look for it online. Uh, we will have a book review at the end of the summer. That's usually the first part of September. I'll keep you posted on that. So you have plenty of time to get the book, read the book, maybe even reread it. But this is our summer read for 2022, Hope Heals by uh, Catherine and Jay Wolf. Also want to remind you of the women's conference coming up May 13th and 14th. Already put this on your prayer list for God to prepare our hearts to receive, also God to prepare the hearts of our guest speakers who are coming, as well as the ladies who will be joining us. We want to see God move in this conference. We want his touch. My prayer is, Lord, prepare me to be that sanctuary where you can just fill me with what I need, because I some days I need a lot, 
every day I need a lot. We will be having a time of dedicated prayer for the conference on Tuesday, May the 11th. It'll be right here in the sanctuary, and we're going to do something a little different this year. We're going to have a time in the morning from 10 until 11, and then we'll have an hour in the evening, 7 to 8. So you have two time slots there. You can come to both if you want to, but uh, this way we can all gather together in the sanctuary for just prayer. No one will be leading it. We'll have our prayer points up on the overhead with some music. And just come in and begin to seek the Lord, intercede, pray for the conference. So mark that on your calendar, May the 11th. That's actually the Tuesday before the conference that weekend. We'll have prayer here in the morning and then also in the evening. Okay, I think enough of announcements. We are moving right along in our study of the Gospel of Mark. We have just a few lessons left. Our final study in here will be April 26th. We'll take a break for the summer, and then we'll come back in September for another study out of God's wonderful book. Don't you just love breaking open the Word of God? And I love doing it with all of you. Thank you each week for coming. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for sharing with me when God has blessed, blessed your heart or just given you some kind of word with what we've shared in here. That's what it's all about. Amen. And I, I'm so grateful for the opportunity that I have to stand here each week and to share with you something that God has shared with me because he's a good God. Yes. Amen. All right. Mark chapter 12, if you want to turn there. Last week we started with what we call Passion Week, and that's the week leading up to Easter. And we spent some time looking at the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This is when he rode on the donkey, a colt who'd never been ridden before. The crowd shouted Hosanna. They waved palm branches. They threw their coats on the road, all in celebration of Jesus. And in some of my research, I found some different timelines trying to connect the Jewish calendar with our American calendar for Passion Week. And one of them listed that this event of the Hosanna Parade would have happened on Monday, like yesterday. So today, Tuesday, Jesus would have gone into the temple and he would have cleaned out all of the corrupt money changers and those that were stealing and cheating God's people as they bought uh, the animals for their sacrifices. On Wednesday, Jesus returned to Jerusalem. It's thought that he was staying in Bethany with Lazarus and his sisters. So he returned to Jerusalem, had more discussions, interactions with the Pharisees and other religious leaders. And then on Thursday is when Jesus and his disciples would have celebrated the Passover meal. Now, this would have been at that Passover meal when Jesus introduced the sacrament of communion, breaking the bread, sharing the wine or the grape juice. And after this time of sweet fellowship, we know Jesus took the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a place they'd gone often as a group, and the purpose was for prayer. Jesus went to pray. And it was here in that garden, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where the angry mob led by Judas Iscariot, other religious leaders from the temple, they came to arrest Jesus. They took him away, several inquisitions, eventually permission granted from Pilate, and then Jesus was crucified on Friday. So the trials, the beatings, all of that took place in, in that late night, Thursday, early morning hours of Friday. Jesus did not sleep. There was no sleep. Saturday was quiet. The disciples were hiding out for fear of the Jewish leaders. It was the Sabbath, so no work was being done. And I'm sure it was a time of reflection, just trying to make sense of everything. Probably one of the most powerful Easter plays I ever remember was highlighting the disciples sitting around on that Saturday, discussing all that had happened. And it was very entertaining how they highlighted each personality of the disciples, but also very moving as they scripted out how the disciples were struggling with crucifixion. So this, that Saturday was a good day to reflect, and I'm probably, we can probably pretty much guarantee that Peter was doing a lot of reflecting that day. But then on Sunday morning, <laughs> Easter morning, everything changed. Jesus' body could not be found 
And word was he had risen from the dead. He was alive. And he began to appear to the different disciples. And I love how the scripture tells us that he specifically reached out to Peter. Oh, don't you just love the mercy and the compassion of our Lord? So maybe this little breakdown of Passion Week will be helpful as you begin to prepare for Easter this week. It's a special celebration. It's the the culmination of the Christmas story. You know, it brings it to its fullest potential. This is why he came. Easter, to die for our sins and be resurrected in power, to give us victory over the evil one. That's a reason to celebrate. Amen? So in today's lesson, if we're following this calendar that I just shared with you, we would be on Wednesday where Jesus had some intense discussions with the Jewish leaders. Now remember, in in the Gospel of Mark, Mark does not share a lot of Jesus' teachings, but he does hear We we saw a little bit at the end of chapter 11, then chapters 12 and 13. And some of these teachings were done in the temple. Some were done outside the temple. Some were directly with the religious leaders. Some were with public crowds. uh, Some were with his disciples. But in these passages, we do see Mark recording now Jesus sharing and teaching a variety of truths. So I want to encourage you over this week, look back, Mark 11, 12, and 13, for these lessons that Jesus taught. Today, we're just going to be looking at Mark 12 and the one lesson that Jesus teaches here on what is the greatest commandment. Now, some scholars believe that this conversation with Jesus was happening in the temple in front of the Sanhedrin court. This was the Jewish court, a religious court. It was made up of about 70 prominent Jewish men Some Pharisees, Sadducees, there were scribes or lawyers who interpreted God's law. You you might compare it to our Supreme Court here in America. These men could make final decisions pertaining to Jewish law. They could recommend death for blaspheming God. They could excommunicate someone from the temple. We see that in John 9 where Jesus had healed a blind man. And because this man seemed to support Jesus, I mean, you know, he did just heal him. So, of course, there might be a little support there. (laughs) The court becomes angry and they cast him out of the temple. They excommunicated him. So within the Jewish community, this court, these men were very powerful. And these men were sorting through all the things that they had seen of Jesus, everything they had heard maybe from others or even their own encounters with Jesus, but they're sorting through on how they could trip Jesus up in some way to be able to arrest him. They, they needed something so they could, you know, pin it on him and actually arrest him. Mark eleven eighteen, 18, we learn religious leaders were seeking how they might destroy Jesus. Mark 12, 12, we're, taught, we're, we're told that they sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitude. And this laying on of hands was not to pray over him, but to actually arrest him and grab him. Verse 13, they sent men to try and catch Jesus in his word. They were so desperate to get rid of Jesus. And so it's thought that this conversation, we're going to look at in chapter 12, is that they're trying to catch Jesus in his words and to be able to have some reason to arrest him. And it is in this conversation now that Jesus tells them, them the greatest commandment. So let's look at this. Mark 12, starting in verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he, Jesus, had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. 
Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Now, I first want to look at the scribe in this story, the unnamed religious lawyer. He would have been responsible for interpreting each of the laws, God's laws, as well as teaching them. He was part of the Pharisees, and he would have been given the respectful title of rabbi. We know that this was a name given to anyone who taught the law, and Jesus was often called or referred to as rabbi. So this scribe would have been a professional theologian and responsible for guarding the proper right interpretation of the law. And here in this passage, Jesus had been in various discussions with the religious leaders. The Bible describes it here as reasoning together with Jesus. And in this moment, this scribe comes up to ask another question. Now, there's almost a sense with this scribe that maybe he was just watching you know, listening to everything that had been said, not really participating, but yet very much interested. And the Bible tells us that he, he agreed with Jesus. He felt Jesus had answered the other religious men with a good response. So this, this scribe, he had a positive reaction to what Jesus was saying. And, you know, kind of appear that maybe he came with an open mind, that he wasn't automatically condemning Jesus or he, was, he hadn't come just to look for a way to catch Jesus in his words. He, he, he liked what he heard. So he proposed another question to Jesus. It was a good question. And it seems that this scribe is asking as an honest inquiry, what is the first commandment of all? Meaning, which one out of all the commandments is the greatest, the most important, the main one to be honored and obeyed. And this was big because at this time, there were 613 precepts in the Jewish law. Remember, there were the laws of Moses that God had handed down to his people in the wilderness, but then there were other numerous laws that had been added through the years. So there was a total of 613 now, 365 of them were negative. Thou shalt not do something. 248 of them were positive. Thou shalt do something. Making a total of 613. And the scribe is asking Jesus, which one? Which one is the greatest? Which one is the most important? Good question. We see Jesus answer, and we're going to go back to this. But this is what he says. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And even though Jesus wasn't asked this, he threw in there the second greatest commandment. He tags it quickly because it's so closely related. You love your neighbor as yourself. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. But look at what the scribe does when Jesus gives him this answer in verse 32. He basically repeats back to Jesus everything he said. The scribe said to Jesus, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there's no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And at first it seemed, you know, you want to ask, was this scribe being patronizing of Jesus? You know, Jesus is the son of God, he's Messiah, and the scribe, kind of has the audacity to compliment him. Well done, Jesus. <laughs> but if you look more closely, look at it again. I think he was truly commending Jesus for what he had said because I believe this scribe truly believed the words of Jesus. He believed what Jesus said. He knew Jesus had spoken truth. There was an Old Testament scripture to back it up. And in front of these other religious leaders, the scribe wanted them to know everything that Jesus had said. It was right. It was true. And so we see him repeating almost word for word what Jesus had answered. I don't think he was patronizing Jesus. I think he was firstly communicating to Jesus. I believe you. 
I believe the words that you speak. But in doing that, he's also confirming to the rest of the men on the court, this guy, Jesus, is speaking truth. How could you argue with what he has just said? Jesus wasn't a false prophet. He had just spoken truth. And I think in repeating it, in commending Jesus for saying it, this scribe was letting this court know, my position, Jesus is not deserving of all this harassing. And I believe Jesus recognized this scribe's belief in him. He saw through to his heart, and that's why he answered there, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far from that place where I'm going to be ruling and reigning in your life. Now, we don't know who the scribe was. We're not given his name. But he must have been of some importance because after this encounter, Mark writes here that no one dared question Jesus after this. Somehow the, the compliment, the words that the scribe said, the acknowledgement of Jesus speaking truth, it just kind of put a damper <laughs> on the court. The wind was taken out of their sails. So who was this scribe? We don't know. But I'm going to throw out two, two potentials for you. It might have been Nicodemus. We met him, John 3. He's a Pharisee. He's a ruler probably had some high position within the group. It's thought when he came to Jesus by night, he was coming because he didn't want to be seen by the others. So probably a little bit famous, probably an influencer, someone very important. And he came asking legitimate questions to Jesus with an open heart, something that this scribe in Mark 12 seems to have. Hmm, maybe Nicodemus. Also possible that this scribe might have been Joseph of Arimathea. Now, we see him over in Mark 15. He's actually recorded. He's actually listed in all the Gospels. And he is the man responsible for going to Pilate and asking for the body of Jesus so that it could be buried. And let me read to you how he is described. When evening had come, this is in Mark 15, verse 42, Because it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. And so when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. So we learn here Joseph of Arimathea is a prominent council member. Maybe he was a scribe. He would have been prominent enough to be able to get an audience with Pilate, the Roman governor, and to ask for Jesus' body. He was a rich man, but more importantly, Mark tells us he was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was waiting for Messiah, so he would be open to Jesus. So there you have it, two possibilities, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Now, obviously, it's not important for us to know that, but it is always fun to ponder over these things. What is important is that he asked Jesus this question, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered. So let's look now at the answer that Jesus gave. What is the first or the greatest commandment? We see it there. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and your strength. This is the greatest commandment. But before it is even possible to love the Lord your God in this way, There has to be an understanding that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is why Jesus makes that statement up front. And Jesus is quoting a passage from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. When God was establishing his relationship with the children of Israel after 400 years in Egyptian bondage, he needed to make it clear to them he was the Lord God Jehovah and he was the only true God. They had been in Egypt a long time. There were a lot of gods in Egypt. 
They were going to see many gods as they walked through the wilderness. They were going to encounter many gods when they got to Canaan. And they needed to have a good understanding that the Lord God Jehovah was the only one true God. All these other gods have been false, fake imitations, poor fake imitations. No other gods created the world and everything in it. No other god has a relationship with his people. No other God is as powerful and mighty. He is the only one true God. And let me just say here, by Jesus quoting this passage from Deuteronomy, from the Old Testament, he was affirming before this Jewish court that he did have a connection. He did have a solidarity with Moses and with the truth of God's word that Moses had been given. Jesus had not come to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill it. We see that in Matthew 5, 17. He came to fulfill the moral law. He came to fulfill the ceremonial laws. The trouble with this court was that their hearts were so far removed from the heart of the original lawgiver, the Lord God Jehovah, and they just weren't able to recognize his son, Jesus the Messiah. But Jesus is attempting here to make that Old Testament connection and verify this is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the word love here that Jesus uses is translated from a verb meaning a love of intelligence, of the will, of purpose, of choice, sacrifice, and obedience. It's a different word than the one describing the love of attraction, as in boy meets girl. Loving the Lord God Jehovah is very much connected with our fear and reverence of him. It's a love based on who he is. It, it, it's a response to a, a genuine knowledge of who this one true God is and all that he is about. And I find it interesting that earlier in this chapter, Mark chapter 12, that these religious leaders had come to Jesus with this kind of bizarre story of a woman who had married seven brothers. You can read it later. She didn't marry them all at the same time, but it's just kind of a bizarre story. It makes you wonder was it really true. And Jesus makes the statement at the end of this odd discussion in verse 24, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. And as I read that, I was so stirred at how Jesus was chastising these religious leaders, professional men who studied the law of God for a living. But yet Jesus says, you don't know the scriptures. You don't know the power of God. There was... You know, a complete disconnect with the information they're reading and the information truly giving them revelation of who this God is. Had they been reading the scriptures just as a piece of literature? Were they dissecting the stories, diagramming the sentences, <laughs> making outlines, but never really having a revelation of who the scripture was describing and talking about? Jesus said, you don't know the scriptures. You don't know the power. That was not a compliment to these religious leaders. And for any of us to truly love God, there must be a knowledge of him. There must be a revelation of him. This is why missionaries go and preach the gospel. This is why we are to witness and to tell others of who Jesus is. There must be a knowledge of him in order to make the choice to love him. And for our love of God to grow, we must have a greater revelation of who he is through the scriptures, through his word. This is why we read our Bibles every day, why we study them, why as we sit down to read, we pray, oh God, give revelation to me to what you're saying. I don't want to read it just as a good book. I don't want to read it just as a piece of literature. It's the living word of God. Speak to me. And why do we want to know more about it? So we can love him more. Philippians 1.9 tells us the prayer the Apostle Paul prayed. I pray that your love may abound still more 
and more in knowledge and all discernment. The more we know him, know who he is, we know his ways, we're able to love him more. Hosea 6, 6 says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I desire the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Oh, do you ever have that longing of just to know him more? The knowledge of God is so much more important than even that outward display of worship to him. Because the more we know him, the more we know about him, the more he's revealed to us, we're going to love him more. Love is very important. 1 Corinthians 13, it's called the love chapter. It tells us all about love and what love looks like. And at the end of that chapter in verse 13, we learn that out of faith, out of hope, and out of love, the greatest of these is love. Love will endure for all of time and eternity. We won't need faith in heaven. We're not going to need hope in heaven. But we will have love. Love for the one true God. Love endures forever. And the places that Jesus mentions here in Mark 12, where love comes from, they are all inside of us. Love comes from the heart, comes from the mind, from our soul, from our strength. Places that we can't see. Yes, love can be demonstrated by outside actions. We see that with the second greatest commandment. But it begins from inside of us. And God has always been about having that relationship with men and women that comes from the inside of us, from a love inside for him. When King David was repenting over his sin with Bathsheba, in Psalms 51, he prayed these words in verse 16. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. It wasn't just the outside actions God was looking for when he said for us to love him with all of our being. He was looking for the inside, the heart, the mind, the soul, our strength. Let it come from inside. In, in Micah, the book of Micah, chapter 6, the prophet writes here, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. All of those outside actions come from an inside that is humble, contrite, and surrendered to the Lord. We love from the inside first. And Jesus makes four distinctions of where love inside of us comes from. He says we love from the heart. The heart is the core of our identity. It's the source of all of our thoughts and our words. Proverbs 4.23 gives us great exhortation. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Jesus said in Matthew 12.34, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Mm. That's hard. Mm. The heart is the core of who we are. We are to love God from our heart. We are to love God from our soul. And this speaks of the emotions, the feelings, the joy, the gladness, all the emotions that go with loving a holy God and having fellowship with him. Our love for God is not to be robotic or stiff. We are free 
to let our feelings go in our love for the Lord. It's okay to be intimate with God. He is the only one we will ever love who will never let us down. He will never hurt us for evil because he is God. He is perfect. His love toward us is perfect. And we can let go of everything of ourself and just love with complete and total abandonment. No matter how many times we've been hurt by earthly people, we can love God completely and totally. He's not going to hurt us. We can love him with our soul. We love from the mind. And this is where we make decisions of surrender to him. We consciously choose his way over our way. This is where as we get to know him, we understand his purposes, his plans. We have discernment. We, we're sensitive to the spirit's leading and nudging. Go talk to that person right now. Ah, uh, don't go to that event. That's not good. Ah, uh, you, you're hanging out with them too much. Now, we, we're, we're, lit, we're sensitive to his nudgings, to his, his, his leading. That's loving him with our mind as we obey and we follow that, as we respond to that nudging. And I'm going to tell you, the more you respond to that, the more he's going to speak. The more he's going to speak to you. And then we love with our strength. And this does speak of that physical energy and function of those outward demonstrations. We do physically show mercy. Physically, we worship with songs. We give praise. We raise our hands. We give offerings. We speak out words of honor and blessing to the Lord. We come together with other believers. We physically pick up our Bibles and read his word. We study those promises and then we wait for him as he speaks to us. There is a discipline and a strength in our love for him. This is where we're, we're constantly stepping closer to him, where we're walking by faith. We're continuing to walk by faith. That takes a discipline and a strength so that we stay in there. That we believe he's mighty and he's working on our behalf. There's a strength. All of these, heart, mind, soul, and strength, work together as we genuinely love the Lord. And you know, it may be a little surprising that Jesus made these separations when he shared this. But, you know, we probably have all struggled in one of these <laughs> one time or another. You know, sometimes it's easy to get the emotions, the soul of us, all stirred up to love Jesus. Sunday morning is a great time. The music is fantastic. Everyone looks their best. Everyone's smiling. And, oh, my goodness, the song, it's got that right chord, and it just hits something right here. And, oh, Jesus, I just love you. But then on Monday morning... <laughs> When he suddenly, in your prayer time, begins to touch on a certain area of your life, oh, well, I'm not quite so emotional now. <laughs> There's a totality. <laughs> every part of us that he's calling, love me. Love me with every part. And I think this is why Jesus tells this very scary story in Matthew chapter 7. where he's warning of false prophets and he's giving description of knowing a true follower of Christ by their fruits. Not by their gifts, but by their fruits. And he says here in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name? We've done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. How could that happen? There was a separation of all the parts in loving Jesus. And we've talked about this before in here. We can be very good at compartmentalizing. Compartmentalizing. We put all of the pieces of our life 
and our worship in little compartments. We have our Jesus time on Sunday morning, and then we do whatever we want every day of the week. We don't bother to come back to church any other time because we came on Sunday. We did our duty. We came on Sunday. <laughs> During Jesus' time with my Bible, with my praise music, my journal, my devotional, I'm going to be spiritual. <laughs> I'm going to think happy thoughts about people. But when I'm out with my friends, I'm going to speak and behave any way I want. We have compartmentalized our love for him. And I believe this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Ephesians 6, where he talks about spiritual warfare. And the very first weapon of our warfare is the belt of truth. And he's not speaking of the word of God there. If you go on to read that passage, that's later on where he talks about the sword of the spirit. The belt of truth is being a truthful person where you are the same all the time. No matter where you are, no matter who you're with, you are that same person. You're not different here at church than you are out at the marketplace. You're not different here on Wednesday night than you are when you're having lunch with your friends. Your opinions are the same. Your actions are the same. You, you know, your attitude, it's the same. You're the same person. There's a sense of a belt of truth. And to be able to do spiritual warfare, you have to be a truthful, it starts with being a truthful person, having all the parts of us together in truth. No compartmentalizing. We can't do that. It's got to all be together. Jesus wants us to love him totally. All the parts of us coming together in complete devotion to him. The psalmist wrote in Psalms 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Unite all these parts of me to love me, in, to love you in spirit and in truth. You know, Jesus loves us wholeheartedly. He gave his entire life, his entire body for us. We should be devoted to him with our whole being, with all parts united together in sincere love and worship. And why can he demand that we love him? <laughs> because he is God and he created us. Oh, that's why it's so important. We have to teach our children about creation. If you remove that element, you have removed so much from our relationship with God. He created us. He is God. He is over all. He is God. He rules over all. He is sovereign. So he can command that we love him with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength. And then Jesus moves on to the next greatest commandment. And that is, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And again, Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament, this time from Leviticus 19, 18. And again, I think he's trying to make that connection in front of this court. There is a connection with Moses that I have. I haven't come to destroy the law. Oh, if those religious leaders could have seen it. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. And this comes as a very close second to the first commandment. Just a few microseconds apart, you know. Have you ever watched the Olympics and the gold and the silver, you know, separated by like two millionths of a second, point zero 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 two? <laughs> and you're thinking, how could that even be? It looks like a tie. But no, it's separate. This is kind of how the second commandment is connected with the greatest one. We love God with all of our being, and then very close to that, we love our neighbor. First John 4 writes this so clearly to us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. <laughs> okay, let's just tell it like it is. If he hates his brother, he's a liar. For he, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. And Jesus pressed the issue even of loving one another. In Matthew chapter 5, 
He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For God, this is your Father in heaven, he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the just unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. We don't just love people we like. We all have people we like. We love people we don't like. We love our enemies. And this is speaking of a love for the soul. And you know, if, if we can ever get to that place in all of our dislike of somebody, that that person has a soul, they're going to spend eternity somewhere. This is why we pray for them. Because if they're not a believer... They desperately need our prayers. And Jesus was making a valuable point here, a powerful point, for everyone on the court and to us today. We're to have the same love and care for our neighbors, our families, strangers, even enemies, even those people we don't like watching on the news. The same love that we have for ourselves. We pray for God to move in our lives and help us and touch us grow in God. Why aren't we praying that for someone that, for Putin, okay? We need to pray that for him. We need to pray for those we don't like, we don't agree. They desperately, out of anybody who needs our prayers. These two commandments intertwined. Yet it was needful for Jesus as he taught this to put one above the other. They are both the greatest, but one is the more greatest. <laughs> and I, I just want to encourage you, these two verses out of all the scriptures can keep us steady and solid when the rest of our life is going nuts. We maintain our, our love for Christ above everything else. And we let that love for him pour out to others. Those are two great solid principles we can build our life on. Every other decision we make in life should be based on those. Very simple. It's not complicated. Not 613. Very simple. Maintain your love for Christ above everything. That's the greatest commandment. If your schedule is so busy you don't have time to sit and worship and just spend time with Jesus, you got to trim your schedule because your love for Christ should be above everything. Very simple. A relationship's pulling you away from Christ, you got to trim the relationship if it's taken away your time with Christ. A job, a project, even a ministry, even a ministry in flag. <laughs> It's okay to say, no, I can't do that. I don't have time to read my Bible to pray. I don't have time to spend with Jesus. Our love for Christ must be above all other loves in our lives. And when we nurture and we protect that as the first and foremost importance of our life, oh, it is so much easier to love all of those around us. Can we all say amen? The more time we spend with the Lord, somehow it's just easier to get along with that person. We can love more perfectly. Why? Is it us? No, it's him. He's the one in us doing the loving. He's the one in us doing the changing, changing our thoughts. Somehow we're blinded to things we used to see with that person. Our reactions to them. Oh, you know, I guess she, she did say that. I didn't even hear her say that. It's the Lord. It's the Lord working in us. And it all begins with us loving him, loving him with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And you know, the more we get to know him from these scriptures, we find out 
just how much he loves us. And I'm telling you, that's a great motivator to love him when you realize how much he loves you. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you this morning for your word that teaches us, that tells us how much you love us. Oh, and then we have the opportunity to love you in return. We love you because you first loved us. We get to love you in return. Help us today, Jesus. We're weak. We're frail. We mess up. Help us, Lord. Unite all of our parts to come together today and love you in all honesty, sincerity, Oh, with the genuine truth, we can say, I love you, Jesus. Here's all of me. Take all of me. Make me what you want me to be because I love you with everything that I am. Touch us today. Let your Holy Spirit just, oh, dive in deep, oh, God, in those places that we've hidden off, we've quarantined off, we've compartmentalized. Break all of that, Jesus. Break it right now this morning because you're wanting true love from your women today. You want to do great things in us and and your will is being hindered when we don't love completely, totally. Unite our hearts to love you completely in truth, Lord, today. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Let there be a burning and a yearning desire in us, Father, for this type relationship with you. You will help us. You will help us. You will forgive us and give us strength, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in our lives. I pray a special blessing on each lady here, those who may be listening later. Just bless them, strengthen them, draw them closer to you, put a greater love and a desire in their heart for your word as they get to know you more, a greater love for you, Jesus. Work in your church today. We thank you and praise you. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, and we will see you next week.